want to disturb it or put something ultra modern, for instance, on top of a, a building of that nature. Um, if there's no questions, I, I'll, I'll run through the comments real quick and then. Uh, just, just a quick question. The, yes. So is that now the main entrance for visitors for, so, for, all, for security purposes? Yes, yeah, so that's a good question. Um, I'll, I'll tell you what we went over with the school district. Obviously, the school district can comment on their own protocols. Um, but the intent would be this entrance while school is, let's say, at arrival in the mornings would be open for students coming in. Once arrival time is done, let's say those first few minutes of the day, that gets locked down, and now this is a secure visitor entrance. Okay. So anybody coming to the school that's a visitor after those arrival and dismissal hours would have to go through this entrance. Good. So just to clarify, that would be open full access in the morning, or would they still have security there to ensure that only students are coming in? So they, the way that their protocols they dictated to us was that they would make sure students are only coming in. I don't know if the door's going to be manned before that, um, but it will be uh, at least a camera and have entrances going into the building at that point after it's locked down during the day so they know who's coming into the building. Okay. They do have an SRO, I know, stationed right here right now doing that same duty. So, so yes. Correct. Correct. And that's on, so what you're looking for is the ground floor level. This is like half sunken into the basement over here. First level, they would come into the building and then go into the main office and guidance would just flip flop in the interior. So just the, the formal comments on that application were um, that the applicant should provide testimony regarding the intended purpose of the security. So I, I think we've covered that and the AEA accessibility. And then the site plan at this level, again, um, we are gonna have to uh, comply with stormwater management, as everybody knows, I have to just state that, that when we go through that application, we will comply with that. And the accessible routes, we're gonna continue the accessible route from the parking lot that's located on the, uh, on the side of the building by the Board of Education office. Any questions on that one? Okay, I just wanna mark for the record then, uh, we will mark as A3, there was a letter dated August 28th um, from the inspector planner, George Dukey, on behalf of the school, uh, submitting the drawing, which Correct. is typically marked as A1. And then we'll mark as PD1, the proposed letter dated December 23rd, 2024, with further comments uh, that were just received. Thank you. So this is the, the second application, site upgrades at Somerville High School. Um, and then exhibit A1, it's the uh, site plan and the same date, eight, August 7th. Um, so again, this is part of the referendum submission process. Uh, it's a schematic level DOE drawing. I understand Mr. Cole had to kind of use his, his every uh, trick under the book to get comments on this one, but it's just a schematic level. We will come back if you need at that point. We are required to undergo uh, and, rec and comply with stormwater management. Um, this, what we're calling a full depth reconstruction, and again, should a referendum pass, we can discuss whether that's uh, leaving sub-base and, uh, and uh, not having to go for the major development versus a million, uh, a million overlay is not what we're intending to do here because the Department of Education deems something that's full depth eligible for state funding. And that's more of the referendum process and I'll let the Board of Ed comment on that. But we submitted this as a full depth for that purpose that the state will contribute up to 40% debt service aid on a project of, of this nature, which is why you're seeing a full depth. Um, what I'm pointing to here, which is note number two, this is the existing parking lot. This is the staff lot across the street from the high school. On, and this is on Davenport. Across the street is the student lot, and then adjacent to the building uh, where the ramp comes out for the gym, who for those who are familiar with the site, is a smaller parking lot for staff, and, and then it wraps around with a roadway connecting out to Orchard. Um, the student lot is roughly 109 spaces right now with no ADA spaces in it. The staff lot is about 124 spaces, two of which are wheelchair ADA spaces. And then the school site actually has two ADA spaces and it's only 22 lots. Um, I can tell you what we have to do, and again, when we go through a final parking plan, should a, a referendum pass, we would do a final parking plan and we're obligated to comply with the number of ADA spaces, which are, we've already informed the Summerville Board of Ed we have to do. So they're aware of the impact and number of spaces, uh, not the final number, but they're aware the number is gonna shift um, for ADA. 
and number of spaces. So that was the first comment on the letter uh, from Mr. Cole. The uh, full depth again. Um, the full depth again was marking about the major development. Um, I don't know if there's any questions on that. The uh, stormwater and the basins that are existing again. When we uh, do a full application at that point, we are have, we're going to be required to comply with stormwater management as well as any soils conservation district measures, and we'll have to make that full submission to the soils district as well at that point. And then the last comment was about parking lot lighting. Um, the lighting is out of the scope of this project, so the existing pole-mounted lighting that's on the uh, wooden utility poles would remain in place. We were, we're, not, we're not increasing or decreasing. We're not touching it. It would stay as is right now. Any uh, questions for those two? So uh, I'll comment on that, you know, so we, we did a public release of the referendum already at the Board of Education level at the, at the last Board of Education meeting. Um, what I can tell you is that the district is looking at different configurations of what a question would look like. It's not finalized yet. Um, what that means is this application may or may not happen with that building or not. So I don't know, I don't want to testify to that building yet. Um, obviously for, for reasons tonight, they're not here and I want the Board of Ed to be here for that one. Um, the, we have to take into account number of spaces obviously in any occupancy in the building. Um, right now we're looking at all options for the configuration. So I, it depends on what happens. This is within the same exact existing footprint. We're not looking to expand it. Correct, correct. For, th for this application, correct. Correct, <laughs> correct. It stands on its own. It's within the same, uh, that's important actually for the Department of Education. When I said about the eligible projects, when the State Department of Education deems a project eligible, that means in this case with parking, it's in the same footprint. That's why we're adhering to that same footprint. If we were to go outside of that footprint, the expense would be borne by the district or the taxpayer in the case of a referendum. But in this case, and all the numbers and tax impact and things like that are not my purview to get into here tonight, but they're, <laughs> I know. <laughs> But um, yeah, exactly. So I'll just let the board make a comment on those. And the referendum will not be on this year's ballot. So the referendum is scheduled for March of 2025 right now. And we'll expect to have all of these costs that I'm mentioning from the state sometime, hopefully in November. But it is, but it is anticipated once, oh, I should say once, if a uh, referendum should pass, those components of the referendum, once the site plans are uh, finalized, you would come back. Yes, if uh, you the Board if of Ed would come back for a full uh, courtesy review. Yes, correct. So it, this satisfies the requirement for the right. Department of Education. Should you guys want that, we will absolutely extend that courtesy to you and, and, and go through that process. Yeah. And, and that's what's been done in the past. So I would, I would, uh, I would think that they would come. Yeah, I think we had. Yeah, we had to do that before. So absolutely. Yeah. All right, I'm going to open up to the public for comments. Okay, hearing none, we'll close public. Uh, comments from the board for a recommendation or non recommendation? There's a recommendation that, uh, a motion to make a recommendation that the board of ed return after the referendum, if it passes, the current plan. Mm -hmm. Second. Uh, we should do a roll call on this, right? Is that the only recommendation? Anything else? Mayor Gallagher? Yes. Councilman Grimm? Yes. Acting Chair Warner? Yes. Acting Vice Chair Carrasco? Yes. Mr. Cleveland? Yes. Mr. Addix? Yes. Mr. Aiken? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you Thank for you. your time. Okay, we are going to move into, um, let's start with the fence ordinance, Mike. 
defense yes. ordinance? Yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chairman, Chairwoman. Uh, based on the meetings, sorry. You're okay. <laughs> <laughs> based on the uh, meeting we had in July, I came up with conditional use standards to uh, address the corner lot fence. And subsequent to that, Kara has made some good comments about cleaning up the language and fine tuning it. Uh, basically, you had two things, one on the site triangle. And at that meeting, we had talked about raising it to 48 inch. And I provided documentation that, in my opinion, it should be higher than 36 inches because of the crown of the road and being able to see. And I provided some documentation from ASHTO and some other governing standards uh, about that. So on the site triangle, the language goes from 50 feet each way from the intersection, from the corner, to 25 feet. And I think uh, I, we had talked about 48 inches. I had recommended 36 inches, and I think Kara had re reduced that down to 30 inches. Uh, so there is discussion on the height that you could see around. It's the motorist vehicles, 42 inches, if you look at the reference documentation. The idea is so you can see a motorist coming down the street or pedestrians. The pedestrians are typically higher than 42 inches, so that's not the issue, but it's the car. It's a sports car. It's the average car. Um, and then Kara had asked, uh, added one comment about uh, landscaping and pruning and stuff in the right-of-way to limit it to over eight feet. And my comment back to her was, well, we have street trees plantings. They're typically branches are lower than eight feet because they're not that, they're going to have to grow. So I'd rather not say that because of street trees. There's no way of getting street trees, in my opinion, to have branches over eight feet. It's just not, I don't see that happening. So uh, we, the, the borough is very good with planting street trees. So I think we, I don't want to see a conflict with the ordinance on street trees. But uh, did I cover that one on the, the corner lot? Yeah, I think the, the only two comments I had was um, whether it should say um, on section 11117I1, uh, we have language saying above no more than 30 inches in height above the center line of the street opposite, opposite uh, or adjacent to, if we should add that additional language. And the other thought I had was, I find a lot of times with these street intersections, and we may actually even have them in our ordinance right yeah. now, showing a little diagram helps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think to clear up any confusion. Yeah. Um, so that was, that was that one comment. And then the subsection two, um, I just said we have no fence or shrubbery, um, and I think I just added planting or other visual obstruction. Um, so and I, I don't think that's a big deal, but I defer to Mike and the board as to what their thoughts are. We can certainly clean up the language, get with Kara's comments, and come up with a clean version for the board for final review. And then the board likes it, it would be a recommendation to council to change the ordinance. But we can certainly make a final copy yep. to include all, all comments and get it back to the board for their sign-off approval of it. Uh, the, last one. the last line. Um, what, what that is saying is that the fees for this application would be no different than anybody anybody applying for a fence on their property other than the zoning permit. That's yeah, that's when, the, that's when the conditional use is on the fences. Yeah. Uh, the site triangle basically says you can't put these structures in that area. There's no, uh, I guess technically you could say it would be a zoning permit. It would be a denial if you wanted to put a, a structure within that 25-25, but typically Mayor, this doesn't come up from a zoning permit application. It's usually a, uh, a, a complaint issue they can't see, and enforcement goes out there and says, cut the shrubbery down or eliminate the, uh, the obstacle or the obstruction. So I don't see this as being a, a application for like a zoning officer to review. The corner lot fences, now that's a different story. That's what we're gonna do next, and that's where the conditional uses. And uh, Kara has comments on that too about the shepherding. It's a good to a segue into the next topic if we want to discuss that now. Yeah, might as well. That's the one where we have corner lots and the concern was that you're getting penalized twice on a corner lot, being you have the frontage or the street address and you have the other frontage, which uh, those 
property owners uh, have a legitimate argument that there's not privacy because you're, you're, you're reduced to four foot fence with 60% opening on two sides of your property. So the, uh, the idea on this was to make it a conditional use which does two things. It allows the planning board to review things that normally the planning board can't review because one and two families are site plan exempt, typically go to the board of adjustment. So a conditional use will allow the board to uh, review these applications. And uh, because of the nature, and there is, and Kara pointed out in some of her comments, one of them is like the good size facing out is subjective. I agree it's subjective. And to handle that, I'm saying have the planning board review it, not the zoning officer. So the concept was that the ARB would review these and make a recommendation similar to what they do right now in the SID. It would be a recommendation. So the acronyms ARB is the Architectural Review Board. Right. Which is a subcommittee out of this body. Subcommittee out, and it was discussion that the SID members all had to live within the borough. Right now that's the case, but uh, uh, Bernie brought up that make that caveat. So that caveat is in there. And then there's some mechanics. In the past, the ARB makes a recommendation. The planning board has to approve it because I don't, in my opinion, the ARB can't approve it because they can't usurp the authority, in my opinion. Yeah. So that was the thought, not reinventing the wheel. So you would have the ARB review this and make a recommendation. This complies with the conditions of the conditional use or no, it doesn't. If it doesn't comply, it would still go to the planning board to confirm that. And then it would be a mechanism to go to the Board of Adjustment because it would be a D4 or D3. It's a conditional use variance. D3. D3. If the board or the planning board says it doesn't comply with the conditions of conditional use, then it has to go to the Board of Adjustment. And what the mayor brought up, okay, what's the fees in all this? The idea was that you would not be penalized for going to the Board of Adjustment. You still have to do the noticing and all this. But the idea was that you would, the $35 would be the zoning permit. The ARB would review it, either say, we think this complies, and the planning board would then have the ARB's comments with, with the application, or the ARB would say, we don't think it complies. The planning board would still see it and say, yes, this doesn't comply. And then that applicant would have to go to the Board of Adjustment for the variance, but there wouldn't be additional application fees is what the mayor came up. It would be handled under the same fee structure mm -hmm. to handle this in that nature. So the fee will allow them to do all different avenues without any extra cost. It's an that's initial correct. fee and that's it. Right. And there's, well, there's a escrow and well, I, I understand what the board's getting at. There's always the issue of initial escrow to review it. But my experience has been, this is only a couple, every four or five years. So I'm willing to eat my review time to get to the, what the mayor wants. The mayor wants, and I understand this. Equal treatment. E yep. Equal, equal treatment. treatment. But if yeah. it's going to go to the Board of Adjustment, the penalty has always been the application fees, the escrow, the higher heightened everything. So if you make the application fees blanket, what's the, the other missing link would be my review fees or CARES review fees. And that's, I can work with that, with, the, with both boards on this issue, but uh, yes. So then you have the conditions, which is the setbacks, going back to what these conditional uses, which Kara had comments on. But before we get to that, I just want to kind of discuss the procedural aspect of going ARB planning board and then planning board, board of adjustment if necessary. Mm -hmm. Was it contemplated that there would this would be a noticed hearing before the planning board after the ARB recommendation? Because typically, let's just say we weren't having, let's say you had a typical conditional use. We weren't talking about fences. We just had a use that was deemed by your ordinance to be a conditional mm -hmm. use. The application, if the applicant felt that it met all of its conditions, would come to the planning board. They would show you it met all the conditions. It would still be a noticed hearing. And then you would make that determination. If you found it didn't, same procedure as what Mike's recommending, they'd have to go to the zoning board. But that would be a noticed hearing. So. Uh just yeah, I, I don't. I didn't problems. perceive it as a noticed hearing. Okay. I, what I perceived it as, it, the the it immediately goes to the ARB for review. Mm -hmm. If the ARB says, you know, if they tickle it and make it work, um, and and the homeowner is is satisfied with that, it appears as a line item on our agenda, and we move forward. 
because they've interpreted, and then ultimately the planning board has interpreted that it's met the conditional use. Okay, we can we can tighten that up a little yeah. bit to make that kind of again. I, it's it's we need parity for homeowners who live on a corner versus homeowners who don't live on a corner who want to put up a fence, yep. and we can't treat them differently. So I know we just discussed noticing, but let's just say the ARB says it's not something that should be recommended and it comes here. They should be a uh, resident and applicant should have an opportunity to come speak before right. as Absolutely. well, it's correct? Okay, so it's not just a matter of it coming to us yes. and they have to just wait in the background, okay. No, it's an application that the, the planning board's gonna have to act either affirmative or negatively on this use, regardless of what the ARB says in my opinion. Okay. ARB approves it, the planning board could say, I don't think this meets the conditions and then the planning board would make a ruling or rule, uh, vote on this if it was it does meet the condition then it would be going the applicant would have to go to the, to the board of adjustment because it wouldn't meet the conditions regardless of what the ARB yes. said. So the only other thing that I have a concern about is I just want to make sure that there is um, we're on the same page as what the ARB has been doing. Um, I know there's been some ARB reviews. I haven't seen them here. So we are relying on this as an A or B review, and then we get that information. Absolutely. I just want to make sure that that procedure is still being followed currently before we hang our hat on this new on this new ordinance. My <coughs> understanding is the A or B meets ad hoc as applications come in, and there's one member of the board of adjustment that chimes in, a member of the planning board, and a member of the DSA. That they all chime in via email, or they meet and make their recommendations, and that's, it's ad hoc. It's not, it used to be back 10 years ago, there was 11 minutes. No, minute but after that, it's supposed yeah. to be coming it's here for official, it's put and I agenda. have not seen that. I know for a fact we've had, I think, yeah. two or three yeah. recently, and they have not, so I just wanna make sure that that part of the procedure is getting buttoned up, and that everything is still coming here so that we are not in violation of them trying to override the, the planning board's authority. And, and what, I what I would also suggest is that we amend the ARB because if we have planning board, zoning board, uh, DSA, we should have a resident as well. It's supposed to have a, re and it does actually technically, I'm sorry, there is a resident on the uh, board currently. Yeah, the, the, the idea was the DSA member was a resident mayor. That was the idea. The okay. Drive, and that's why it said the DSA member had to be a resident. Yes. It was in the language. Okay. Yep. All right, that's good. That. Good. And then you can see the conditions, and Kara had some good comments on the conditions. And if you want to go through them all, I like to clean it all up to get the language, but it's the flexibility that we talked about, about the setbacks and the height and the. So, qu question on that. So, having a DSA that's also a resident. Aren't there, doesn't that same person have kind of different, looking through different lenses, right? A DSA has a different lens they look through than a resident that's not involved with the DSA. So it would make sense to put a fourth person on that. I know that creates two and two for, that might be an issue with voting and making decisions, but I would say you still need a resident. Yeah, I, I, I have no problem bringing a resident on and I have no problem with two versus two because it ultimately has to come here. And if it's split, we still have to make a decision. Correct. And I think, we should look at the ARB regs because for some reason I'm remembering that since I've been here, we did do an amendment to the ARB procedure. I just don't offhand recall exactly what that was. So let's take a look and let's make sure that any change yeah. we made before mm -hmm. doesn't impact what we're trying to do here to Lisa's point, That's the my chairwoman's point. Yeah. yeah. So maybe we put that on the agenda. How about we do it the ninth? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes, we Fine. have, yes. I think it definitely needs yeah. to get put on for. Yeah. Okay. We'll look at that too. And then if you, if you look, and Kara had some good comments to clean this up about I had language that the side of the lot that's not the address, Kara cleaned it up. So you see the conditions on the different flexibility that the property owner has and and that others, the other side of the corner lot, front facing. Uh, I would like to get with Kara and to meet with Kara and clean it all up. Uh, but the board has the, the idea. The idea is exactly what we talked about in the last meeting. Uh, it's basically allowing a lot of different ways, avenues of addressing the concern being privacy for not having two small fences on two sides of your property. That's, that was the concern. Mm -hmm. 
So the board likes, I'd like to clean this up with Kara and get you a clean yep. copy with all our comments done. Yep. But then you can bleed all over it or we can tweak that, you know. I, I think listen. we're on the right path. Yeah. Yeah. I think I we're think doing, we're doing, doing it right. Really well. I mean, yes. I think um, I think it's on the, the path. And then we're going to have to amend the fee schedule or to address this or define it. And we can certainly, once we have the language right, I can, we can go through and make sure we picked up everything like in the A or B on making sure that the fee schedule in the ordinance reflects. Right. So the things change, it's, it's clear that this is the process, as the mayor had said. Good. And I definitely like uh, Kara's idea of the visual. I think that, especially because this is meant for residents to be able to understand. Yeah. I know we all understand it, but we're the ones that have been looking at stuff like this for quite a bit, so. And I think Mike had found a couple. Um, yeah. 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 yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think that'll be helpful. They're generic enough. They're just yep. they're generic. Of where the measurement comes from and why. And it helps the ARB, too. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so I, it kind of helps everybody along the way. We could have this all for the ninth, for the next meeting, do we think? We could try. Yeah. Just, I just it's don't want to delay too much longer yeah. before we right. get it to the council. Yeah, because it's got to come up to us, and then we have to amend the ordinance, so that takes yeah. time as well. Yeah. We'll work on it. We'll get you something. Yeah. We want to make sure you have enough time yeah. also to take a look at it. And we'll, we'll look at what the agenda for the ninth looks like to make sure. And the approach overall, if you look at land use ordinances, the approach is to try to get conditional uses because that would empower the planning board more. We have issues where the board doesn't have jurisdiction over certain things. If the board wants jurisdiction, the conditional use would allow the board more, uh, more flexibility in matters that right now they, they don't, you guys don't review. That's, I'm just telling you, that's the overall theme mm -hmm. on how to address, because I know that we have other ordinances coming up or things that the, that the board wants to look at. I'm just saying that my thinking is to try to approach some of these with conditional uses. Just throwing it out. All right. Anything else? Anybody have anything else on that? All right. Uh, so that brings us to, oh, do we, we don't need to do any action on that, right? Because we're just reviewing no. and, okay. Nope. Um, so the next one is going to be the crosswalk. Um, I am going to have Mayor Gallagher give us a little bit more information on this because <laughs> you saw this way before any of us saw it. Um, yeah, well, apparently this has been floating around since yeah. 22 before, uh, before I came back. Um, DOT is looking to yeah. put in a signaled crosswalk. Uh, on West End Avenue, uh, right, right near the entrance exit of the Immaculate Conception School Driveway. So if you, if you know that driveway right now, the crosswalk, let me back up a second. There, between yeah. Middaw and Mountain, there are no crosswalks. That's an extremely long section to go without having a crosswalk. Especially with the school, yeah. And, and uh, seniors, and you know, it's 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 a problem. So um, apparently, DOT has crafted a plan to put in a mid-block crosswalk, um, which one already exists, which is located directly between the two uh, entrance and exit driveways of Immaculate Conception School, which is not a great spot for it, right between it. So DOT, uh, I think, is getting ready to pull the trigger on, on moving on this and installing uh, a, a revised mid-block crosswalk along with signalization, uh, button-activated signalization. So they had sent this a while back. Um, it came across my desk again. And uh, they are looking for the council to pass a resolution in support of this. Um, it's a state highway. Uh, I think it's probably one of those that it's more of a courtesy review because it is a state highway and, and they obviously have jurisdiction over the state highway. They can do what they want, but I give them credit for, uh, for, for approaching us. So um, that's kind of the mix of it. So if you take a look at what they have here, it looks like they're moving the crosswalk a little bit west. So it's west of the exit driveway, which I think is a good thing. Yeah. It gets it out of that flow of, of vehicular traffic. Um, I did send this over to the Monsignor so he could have a look at it uh, along with his, uh, his, his staff. I haven't heard back from them yet, um, but I thought it most appropriate for the, uh, uh, this, this body to have a crack at looking at it 
to make sure that it comply, we shouldn't, I shouldn't say comply, that it fits with what we think is a, is a, a safe overall operation from our perspective, because we're the, we're the feet on the ground. This is designed by engineers in an office. So, uh, Mike, anything to add to that? Uh, if, the, if the board likes this, I, if the board likes or agrees with endorsement on the DOT crosswalks, the only caveat I would say is see if the crosswalks can uh, incorporate the, the humps that uh, the rescue, the OEM fire guys have approved, which is the small detail. This is what's being done on residential streets when there's this traffic calming speed uh, hump required. That, that's the detail that has been approved by the, the Board of Engineers. Yeah, on a state no. highway? I know. They're going to have to do their own thing. I know. I know. <laughs> I, it's a great thought. <laughs> I know it's pie in the sky, but. So, yeah. I'm sorry. So the only thing that I see, though, is this is actually two different locations. Yeah. 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 So the other location is between Division and Union. Union and May, or Maple. Maple. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah, but I see. I was looking at the top ah, the streets, yeah. not the well, whatever. Um, it's the existing. That yeah. Let's walk there. Yeah. So they're looking to just improve that in site visibility. And signalization. Yeah. Yeah. And the signage. I think the signage is proposed. Yeah. All mm -hmm. this. Those green signs, the pedestrian signs, I don't think they're, uh, you see the, they're giving you warnings ahead. I don't think that currently exists, those warnings. But is there an actual crosswalk there? Yes. There yeah. is. Yes. Yes. Yeah. We have one. We have one there. Okay. It's right by the uh, alley. Yeah. Ah. That cuts mm -hmm. back. Mm -hmm. Okay, then yes. That is it, I believe. Correct. Alley comes out. It would have to be walk. based on here. Yeah, you're right. And that's where this is, right? Yeah. This yes. Is, yes. See, yep. There they're adding signage and lighting. Is this yes. going to be like the ones in Princeton and in Witherspoon? Down the road? Not really. Yes. Small Speed tables. Yeah. That's yes. exactly what it's called. Right. right. Yeah. And that's annoying. Yeah. Nobody wants that. But I think I drive the details. It's not outrageous. Mm -hmm. Right. Plus, if it's 25 miles an hour in town anyway, it's just sure. Right. So what, what I, well, what I'm really looking for is the planning board to uh, um, just Make a recommendation. Make a recommendation to council that you agree with these improvements, and then the council then can can draft a resolution of support to the DOT, referencing the planning board's approval as well. So do we have a motion? I'm going to traffic, traffic uh, signal lights. What's that? Can we trade them for traffic <laughs> signal lights in certain parts of town? That's a different battle. Highly annoying. That's a different battle. <laughs> I'll make a motion to make a recommendation to council. Um, to write a letter of recommendation in support of the two new um, crossing improvements. I'll second that. Mayor Gallagher? Yes. Councilman Vroom? Yes. Acting Chair Warner? Yes. Acting Vice Chair Carrasco? Yes. Mr. Cleveland? Yes. Mr. Addix? Yes. Mr. Aiken? Yes. I gotta write that one down. Yeah. <laughs> Better late than never. All right, uh, I have no comments. Uh, why don't I op uh, open this up to the public for comments on anything? Come on up, please state your name and address for the record. Mm -hmm. Yep. Hey, I just have a real quick comment. Name and address, please, Rich O'Neill. I, I gotta look up my address. <laughs> yeah. 124 West Cliff Street. Thank you. You're talking about the uh, architectural review board. You have two members of the of the public citizens of town on that because to be it, be on the board of adjustment, to be on the planning board, you live in town, so it automatically takes care of that problem. Okay. That's it. Thank you. Turn your mic on, Larry. Thank you. Uh, Rich, what I was going to ask you is, 
it seems like the intent of having a public person would be somebody who's not official, who's not a planning board member, who's not already a board of adjustment member. And those deputies are staying pretty much down there. We got plenty of people around town who just love to volunteer and do stuff for free. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> you come out to night meetings, night meetings, uh, watch well, emails. Sure. <laughs> Am I wrong? No, you're absolutely right. <laughs> we'll find you. Yeah. Okay, anybody else from the public? All right, we'll close public session. Uh, before we do end, I just want to do thank Jenna. Today is her last day. No, thank it's you not. for. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in denial. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute, what happened? <laughs> no one wants her to leave, particularly me. Yes. But thank you for everything while you've been on the board. Good luck in your new endeavors, and we will miss you. So thank you for everything. Thank you. Thank you, Jenna. All right, I will take a motion to close out. So moved. I need a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed?